Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. With us on our game day segment in just a few minutes will be one of the talented young writers from the Wolverine, Clayton Safey. Before he joins us, a few of my thoughts to get us started. Michigan Hoops entertains Purdue on Thursday night at Chrysler in a huge game. Uh, We're not sure if Jet Howard will be able to play or how long his ankle injury will keep him sidelined. As inconsistent as this team has been so far, there will be plenty of opportunities in the coming weeks to make a run at an NCAA tournament bid. Now, I'm not sure if they can do it, but this is a young team with a lot of talent. It's just a matter of gelling at the right time. February will tell the story for Jawan Howard's team. As far as football goes, there is a lot going on, and there are a lot of questions. Who will replace Matt Weiss? What's next in this NCAA investigation? Will we really have some big NIL news in the coming weeks? When will Jim's contract get finalized? It hasn't been, and it will not be, a quiet offseason when it comes to Michigan football. My guest today weighs in on most of the questions I just mentioned. Joining us next on our game day segment is the talented young writer from The Wolverine Magazine and Wolverine on 3, Clayton Safey. So stay with us. on our game day segment this week is Clayton Safey from the Wolverine Magazine and the Wolverine on 3. Great to have you back with us, Clayton. Great to be on. Thrilled to be here. Well, let's start uh, with some basketball talk, Clayton, uh, as we are well into the Big Ten season now. I guess the uh, the latest news uh, of concern on Sunday was Jet Howard uh, suffering that ankle injury against Minnesota. What's the latest on that? Yeah, I'm not sure his status exactly for uh, Thursday's game, but it does sound like x-rays were negative. So, you know, in terms of seeing him down on the court and kind of fearing the worst, uh, I don't think it's going to be that. It seems like an ankle sprain. And, uh, you know, you, you fear it's not the, the dreaded high ankle sprain. If, if not, you know, I think we see Jet Howard back fairly soon. And, and Jawan Howard was talking about swelling being the issue. So, who knows uh, for Thursday against Purdue, obviously it would be huge to have him out there, but just big to have him back soon in general, whether it's Purdue or not. I mean, in terms of the offense, I thought it, you know, it ran a little bit uh, sluggish uh, with him not in there against Minnesota and they were able to squeak that win out. But uh, I think they need a little bit more from, uh, from the offense. Uh, it's been a little inconsistent lately. So uh, with him back in there, it gives them some more options. It doesn't put as much stress on guys like Doug McDaniel and Kobe Buck. Yeah, it'll be great to get him back sooner than later. Sunday's win, though, over Minnesota, that was, it was ugly, but, you know, it was still a W, so you don't apologize for that. That said, mm-hmm. uh, Michigan has got to uh, start playing at another level, and you start with Purdue on Thursday, and then there's a heck of a stretch of games coming up, isn't there? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, they're sitting at 5-3 and three right now, and you're right. I mean, you don't apologize for it. And it was funny, uh, Hunter Dickinson said the, those exact words on Sunday after the game, he said, Hey, we're second place in the big 10. We're not going to apologize for it. And, and that's great. Um, but you also look at the schedule. You look at the big 10, a couple things. One, the big 10 is not very strong this year. I think one team currently in the top 25 and that's Purdue sitting at number one in the country. And then another thing is Michigan's schedule has been a little bit light to start. You know, they've played eight games, but they have avoided playing the top five teams in the big 10. If you look at 10 palms rankings, uh, and that's about to change. Purdue, um, you know, you're going to get Ohio State. You're going to get Indiana. You're going to get Illinois. You know, you get Indiana twice there. And you you have tough games against Rutgers as well. Um, you still have to play Michigan State again. Wisconsin's going to be a challenge, especially in Madison. So the schedule gets tougher. So not only do you need to continue to do what you're doing in terms of holding serve at home and, you know, playing close on the road, hopefully uh, pull out some of those victories soon. But you have to start playing better because the competition's going to be better. So, you're right. Uh, starts with getting Jet Howard back, but I think it, it really starts with this team on the defensive end. And he's been part of the issue, to be completely honest, uh, on that side. We saw him play a little better defensively against Minnesota when he went out. 
Um, and, you know, it, that, you know, not a knock on him. He's a freshman, but, uh, you know, he needs to get better there. And, and so does the entire team. But, you know, you're right. I, I think that this team has shown enough flashes to, you know, feel like they can beat anybody. But they've also had those lows and in, in those, you know, the, the lows have been as bad as they get. And they can lose to anybody, as we saw on December 29th against Central Michigan. Well, uh, if Jet is out, and as we mentioned, we're not sure how long that might be. So other than Hunter Dickinson, who do you see stepping up or, or who has to step up to get some offense or give more offense, Clayton? Yeah, I think first and foremost, I would point to Joey Baker. I mean, he's a guy that's experienced. He started the second half against Minnesota after Jet went down with a couple minutes to go in the first half. So it seems like that's kind of the natural pick to replace him in the starting lineup. And I know Joey Baker is a little bit one-dimensional offensively. He's a really good shooter, uh, especially on the catch-and-shoot. Doesn't do a ton off the bounce. Uh, and, you know, he's not a great on-ball defender. But I do see Joey as one of those guys that's one of the best communicators on the floor defensively when he's out there. Uh, he's also really good in help side defense. He's always in the right spot. He may not have the athleticism to, you know, stop some of these guys from blowing by. But, um, you know, I feel like, you know, that team's a little bit more connected when he's out there defensively. So that's a place to start, but it's going to be everybody, including, uh, you know, not just the replacements for Jet Howard, like Will Chatter, who I think we'll see more of, uh, even Terrace Reed at the four spot playing alongside Hunter Dickinson, like we've seen the last few games, but there's going to be more on Hunter Dickinson. There's going to be more on Doug McDaniel, Kobe Buffkin. And can they handle that? You know, Doug McDaniel has been a little bit hit or miss, uh, you know, and, and that's to be expected from a freshman point guard. He's been thrust into a really challenging role here, something that if you turn back the calendar a year that nobody expected him to be in. I mean, people thought maybe he'd redshirt when you were looking at Frankie Collins coming back and, you know, potentially bringing in a transfer like they did with Jalen Llewellyn. So, um, you know, I mean, Kobe Bufkin's the youngest scholarship player on the team, but I think both of those guys need to step up as well because Jet Howard isn't just a shooter. You know, he, he handles the ball a lot for them as well. Uh, runs a lot of the ball screen actions, and uh, that's going to be important that those two guys can take that uh, load. And, um, but at the end of the day, you still got to play through Hunter Dickinson uh, against Purdue specifically. I think we'll see him in some pick and pop type of stuff. He's averaging uh, three made threes a game over the last two outings against Purdue with Zach Eady and, and some of their bigs in there. He's able to pick and pop a little bit more. That's going to be important. You're right. There's a lot going on for Hunter Dickinson. The offense does have to go through him. And so far this year, how would you describe his play? Yeah, it's been, you know, a little disappointing if you look at the overall season um, from Hunter Dickinson. And it's another year where he's kind of had to be the guy on a team as opposed to when you look at his freshman season where they had so many different options on both ends and you know he was kind of able to just get his when he was when he was called upon you know now it's it's you know all of his struggles uh in, in certain games have been magnified i also think there have been times when michigan hasn't helped him out enough and, and you know really played through him enough uh in a couple areas you know there were some games where they go away from him in, in key stretches and i don't think you know it, it's tough to play through a big guy especially late in games just because they can't control when they get the ball and you know, other teams can do things to, to take him away. But, you know, I, I also think that when he's getting double teams, uh, they've got to move the ball better and they've got to shoot better so that teams can't just swarm him. So he has kind of a, a tough, you know, situation. By all accounts, I think he's doing a better job leading this team this year than he did a year ago, helping out Eli Brooks. But um, he's been a little bit up and down. It's been a little disappointing. On the silver lining side of things, I mean – I don't know about you, Mike, but I feel a little bit more, you know, not confident, but, you know, I feel like there's a higher chance that Hunter Dickinson may be back for next season, just given, uh, you know, not just the way he's playing, but, um, you know, the way that I think this team could come together next year, if you look at all the pieces with everybody a year old. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that would be a good thing for him too, long-term. And when we're watching this team though, this year, and I don't think it's just me, I hear this from listeners all the time. They can be really hard to watch. I mean, the offense looks good in stretches, and you think, hey, we're figuring it out. Then incredibly sloppy for long periods of time. You <laughs> mark that down as youth and, and this team trying to come together. What would you say is the main reason for that, Clayton? Definitely the ups and downs and inconsistency seems to be a sign of a young team or, or a byproduct of a young team. Um so that's definitely part of it. A young point guard, you know, I think that 
when you look throughout Michigan basketball history and really in the last 13, 14 years, the point guard play has been at a super high level, uh, you know, even at times with some of the transfers over the last few years, but most especially, you know, from the Darius Morris days until the Xavier Simpson era. Um, and, you know, Doug McDaniel, I think he's going to be really good here. I think he could be special potentially later on in his career. I, I've been a Doug McDaniel fan since he was a recruit. I went down to Atlanta and saw him in person and, and talked to him. And I just thought, I really like this kid's mentality in and, and his game, but it's tough as a freshman point guard. Um, so, you know, some of it's youth. I also think, you know, the, the coaching staff could, could have done a little bit more this year to, you know, just feels like they've come out flat in several games and they can't afford to do that. I mean, they created, you know, such a small margin for error for themselves with some of the early season losses. Uh, if they could have, you know, found a way to hold on against Virginia at home, they, instead they lose by two points. If they could have eked out a win against Kentucky and London, or if they could have just avoided disaster against Central Michigan, I think that we're looking at a completely different picture here, um, you know, going into the rest of the season. Now, they don't need to be perfect, but they have to be pretty close down the stretch. And when you factor in what we talked about earlier with the Big Ten being a little bit down, there aren't as many marquee wins out there to get. So you've got to be even better maybe than in years past. It's interesting. It's tough to really pinpoint because you're right. There are times when they come out and they look so good on, uh, you know, mostly the offensive end. You know, they put up 85 on Northwestern. and they didn't play a lick of defense in that game, uh, maybe a couple stretches. But you're thinking, man, that offense, when it's clicking, I mean, it is, it's fun to watch. But then they do what they did against Minnesota. And I know they didn't have Jet Howard, but even, you know, a few days before that against Maryland, it was pretty disappointing of an effort. So uh, it's hard to pinpoint the issue. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of it is probably you, just like you said. Well, we're five and three uh, in the Big Ten heading into uh, this week's action. I think we have uh, nine quad one games left on the schedule as of now. So there are more than enough opportunities to get into uh, tournament consideration, aren't there, Clayton? I mean, there are. And, you know, like I said, I mean, it doesn't feel like last year with the Big Ten when it was like every win you got was like gold, uh, you know, because it was so strong, especially in the regular season. It has become a trend. Uh, not so much maybe in March other than Michigan, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are still some opportunities out there. Look at Ohio state, Indiana, Illinois, uh, you know, you're going to have to go to Jersey Mike's arena, the rack to play Rutgers. So there are going to be some opportunities out there at the same time. And you're sitting there thinking if you're a Michigan fan, this team hasn't proven to me, uh, you know, that it can get those, you know, wins consistently at least. Um, so that's a concern, but if they do turn a corner, then I, I think we're looking at enough opportunities for Michigan to get in. Well, one game at a time, and of course, uh, we're taping on Wednesday, tomorrow night, Thursday night, uh, a big one against Purdue, and we'll uh, a big yep. challenge and great opportunity. So let's talk a little football uh, news with uh, a lot going on on that front too, Clayton. Uh, we've seen some names tossed out to replace uh, Matt Weiss as assistant, OC, and quarterback coach. Do you think Jim wants to move fast on replacing him? I would think, uh, you know, fairly fairly quick here. Um, and, you know, you're kind of seeing that process with a couple candidates emerging already. Um, you know, but I think he wants to get it right, too. And, uh, you know, I will say, as you kind of see some candidates emerge, it, it does seem like, and I've always noticed this, uh, you know, going back to, I think, when DJ Durkin left. Uh, and, you know, he did a fine job here in 2015 as a defensive coordinator, but Harbaugh was saying, hey, we want to upgrade here. You know, even if a guy leaves um, and it wasn't performance related that you let him go, which in this case, or they leave for another job, you know, maybe a promotion of sorts. You know, he's still looking to, to uh, you know, upgrade. He's still looking at, hey, what did Matt Weiss do well? What did he not do so well? Um, I think you're seeing an emphasis on recruiting. You know, Matt Weiss was, uh, you know, not a great recruiter, not a good recruiter, frankly, uh, you know, not even an average recruiter. He was talking mid season at times, uh, or not at times, but at a press conference about how he didn't realize how big relationships were in recruiting. That's kind of a red flag a little bit. <laughs> he has a great, great football knowledge, but uh, definitely didn't recruit all that well. And then if you look at the past game as well, uh, I think he wants to, to maybe bring in somebody with a little bit uh, more knowledge of the past game and uh, is a little more adept to helping Michigan out there. Uh, and, you know, that's where I think a guy like Kirk Campbell could come in. He's a candidate as, a, as an analyst. He's been here for a year. 
uh, and apparently has, has done a really good job behind the scenes and impressed Jim Harbaugh, and that's why he's in the pool. You look at another guy like T. Martin, who's the Baltimore Ravens wide receivers coach, but was a heck of a recruiter back when he coached college at Tennessee, Kentucky, USC. He was bringing in some big-time guys and not just wide receivers or quarterbacks. We're talking offensive linemen, all sorts of guys that they had him recruit. Uh, and, and, of course, can help with the pass game as well. So um, I think those two areas are going to be big for Michigan to potentially upgrade with, even though Matt Weiss was not let go due to uh, performance-related issues. Well, another name you hear mentioned is uh, Brian Greasy, which uh, I think fans uh, really get excited about. He's out as a San Francisco, the 49ers quarterback coach. You think that Michigan's even really reached out to him? I think they might have. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the word on the street. Haven't totally confirmed that, but uh, also the word on the street is that he's probably going to stay put and, and would maybe uh, decline um, an overture there. Uh, and he wants to stay with Kyle Shanahan out with the San Francisco 49ers. Plus, if you look at the timeline of this thing and, and when you want to talk about moving quickly, uh, I don't think that Michigan is going to have that luxury uh, potentially with Brian Greasy given that, you know, he has a big game this weekend and potentially a, an even bigger game two weeks after that. So uh, I think he's kind of focused on, on staying there. And he's only one year into his coaching career, too. So I think, uh, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. But a little bit of word that Jim Harbaugh reached out there. And, uh, you know, I think that, that definitely excited people. When you have a national championship winning quarterback who is out there in the coaching world and, you know, you have an opening for your quarterback coaching job, you might as well at least reach out and shoot him a text. And I think uh, that's probably what happened, but not sure we're going to see uh, 14 back here uh, you know, quite yet. Well, once uh, we get Matt Weiss replaced, whoever that replacement is, do you think Sharon Moore will be uh, named the offensive coordinator, no co in front of that? That's a great question. I feel like, I feel like it will be that way. Uh, I feel like he will be the, the offensive coordinator. Um, and if you look at, again, kind of what Jim Harbaugh is looking for, if you look at some of the candidates, and again, some of the names I'm throwing out, there could be somebody that comes out of nowhere as well. I remember that with Mike McDonald, where we had heard something at like midnight the night before he was hired, uh, and nobody had thrown his name out there in the week-long uh, search for a defensive coordinator two seasons ago. So got to keep that in mind as well. But based on kind of, you know, uh, fitting some of these pieces together and, and kind of looking at what Jim Harbaugh is searching for, it does seem like uh, that would be more of a quarterback coach, pass game coordinator type of guy. Uh, and then Sharon Moore, who in my opinion has earned this opportunity to become the sole offensive coordinator with some help, of course, it'll always be collaborative. And I think sometimes people forget that Mike Hart has the title of run game coordinator as well. So and Jim Harbaugh is, you know, an offensive mind himself. So, you're going to have the collaboration, but I think Sharon Moore has earned it. Every single time Jim Harbaugh has put more on his plate, he has delivered. Think of last season for Sharon Moore. He had a new uh, baby uh, that year. He also was probably Michigan's most impressive recruiter on the trail. And, you know, he, he did a heck of a job with the offense and the offensive line winning two straight Joe Moore awards. So can't say enough good things about Sharon Moore. I think he's earned it. Uh, and, you know, hey, if I'm a if I was a betting man, which I may or may not be, I would say that uh, that I would bet on that being Sharon Moore's title. Staff's been out uh, on the recruiting trail a big time in the last two weeks. And I think we all realize, uh, putting it mildly, this is a huge recruiting cycle for the future of Michigan football, isn't it, Clayton? It is. I mean, you know, I, I want to stop short of maybe calling the 2023 class lackluster, uh, especially because they still have a couple big time targets that are out there and they can potentially land. But I think when you look at going to two straight college football playoffs, uh, you have to deliver on the recruiting trail and take advantage of that momentum. And I, I think that Michigan has a better chance this year to do that uh, than a year ago for a couple of reasons. One, um, they started out that class pretty strong. That was a pretty quiet storyline uh, over the last year because as we know, they're, they're always working on the current cycle the most, but they're also doing their legwork for the next cycle. And Michigan is, is sitting pretty good here with a few uh, four-star commits in the 2024 class. Uh, so I think that they've already built some momentum there. They have a bunch of ins with other big-time guys that uh, you would say maybe they lead with, uh, maybe a little too early to say that. But, uh, you know, Michigan's definitely in good shape there. And then the second thing is, I think the perception around Michigan's NIL has really improved. Uh, I think that the guys over at Valiant Management, the Champion Circle, you look at the One More Year Fund, um, you know, that's all really good stuff that they're doing. And 
couple that with the administration looking like it's a little more, uh, you know, willing to to play ball a little bit. And, and not I'm not talking about breaking rules or gray areas, but just say, uh, you know, just embracing this and saying, hey, here's, here's our collective. Here's how you can help. Here's where to, you know, put your money. And uh, from everything we've heard, that has gone really, really well over the last, you know, couple months since Word Manual sent out an email encouraging donors to uh, to you know put their money there. So I think those are a couple of reasons. Um, you know, our recruiting reporters over at the Wolverine do an outstanding job uh, covering this stuff. And you know, I read every single day. It feels like there's something positive about 2024. Um, you know, they're trying to get Nicholas Harbor, five-star athlete, in the 2023 class. Not sure that's going to happen. Uh, you know, they'll probably land one or two guys here before the late signing period. But I'm looking at 2024 as a potentially top five, got to be in the top 10, in my opinion, class, uh, just because of the on-field success you've had. If you can get back on track like that, then, uh, you know, I think the 2023 class will prove to be an aberration. And, you know, you can kind of move forward from there, restock the, the roster with a lot of talent. Well, in that class of 24, the the kid we hear the most talk about, uh, especially from my listeners, is Jaden Davis. And (laughs) I mean, we get coverage on him every day. And, you know, I'm not sure if he's wavering or not. It's hard to tell, but it sure seems like it, doesn't it? It does. I mean, man, if, if, uh, you know, you kind of have a quote unquote favorite for about nine months, then (laughs) is it really, you know, maybe it's still the favorite, but is it going to be the most likely outcome? Um, you know, I, again, I, I don't cover it closely to, to make a, a prediction on that, but to me, I'm with you. I think he, he probably is wavering or he's maybe not wavering, but waiting to see what else is out there. And, you know, the fact that Michigan hasn't sealed the deal is a little bit disappointing. Now you could also point to something like NIL on that. And when you see quarterbacks around the country, uh, who seem to be, it's kind of a, a different game for every other position, and then quarterback. I mean, Jaden Rashada at Florida was rumored to get $13 million. He wasn't, they didn't follow through on it, and now he's on the open market again going through the recruiting process. So it's crazy out there with quarterbacks. Uh, I'm a little hesitant, you know, uh, you know, to say that Jaden Davis is going to land at Michigan just because of that. But, you know, I still think Michigan can get it done there, and hiring a really good recruiter at the quarterback coach position I think would help. But, uh, yeah, you're seeing Jim Harbaugh take on that recruitment uh, apparently had a really positive call with Jaden Davis last week. Uh, he also met with uh, uh, Dominic Rayola's son, who's the number one overall prospect in 2024, the quarterback position. Uh, and maybe that's a sign that, Hey, we're not going to you know keep all our eggs in this basket. Maybe we will look around and maybe that's just, you know, showing a little, you know, putting a little pressure on, uh, on Jaden Davis to say, Hey, we're, we're going to look around a little bit, make your decision, please. Uh, uh, who knows? But uh, it's definitely been an interesting recruitment to follow. Well, getting back to uh, NIL for just a, a moment, uh, Valiant, as as you mentioned and we've seen, has been making news, doing good things. Uh, but we keep hearing, uh, you know, stay tuned for more big news on the NIL front. <laughs> we started hearing that in November. Michigan, what we do know, has got to get up to speed fast on that, don't they, Clayton? Uh, I agree with you. You know, I, I do think we've seen some strides. Uh, again, Ward Manual kind of embracing it a little bit more. Uh, you know, you're seeing the the collectives. I think that had an impact on the collectives, specifically the biggest one, as you mentioned, Valiant Management's champion circle. From what we've heard, they've been able to raise a good amount of money after that. And then they've done some uh, crowdfunding as well with the One More Year Fund, and that raised over $100,000 in just about a week. Plus, that didn't count the uh, the donations that were over five thousand dollars. So that's important to note as well. And they have a whole collective backing them too. So that that went a long way to getting some of those guys back, like Zach Center, Trevor Keegan, even Blake Corum, who's got other deals himself. Um, so that's important. But you're right; uh, it does sound like there's something in the works with a marketing agency that Michigan's going to, uh, you know, make some moves with. But uh, that still hasn't come, and, and don't want to throw a timeline on that. But I, I do think that they are making some positive steps, but I also will say this: I mean, it's 2023, this thing passed in 2021. Uh, you know, they were a little bit reactive instead of being proactive. And, uh, you know, maybe that's the, the Michigan way, uh, you know, as we've seen it on different issues lately, but I don't feel like it has to be. When you're the leaders in basket, you should have been a little bit uh, better equipped. Amen to that. So hopefully in the uh, coming weeks, we will get that big news on the NIL front. We'll just have to see. Stay tuned. Yes. 
Final question before we let you get away, though, Clayton, and I, I probably should have brought this one up earlier, but the NCAA investigation is still underway, and Michigan is digging in, it appears, uh, uh, when it comes to the allegation that Jim knowingly lied or misled investigators. Do you think this whole thing ends with any kind of stiff penalties against Jim or the program? I think they'll probably get some penalties for the level two violations that included some minor recruiting stuff and an analyst coaching on the field. And by the way, that rule is about to change anyway, where it looks like analysts uh, and really any staff member is going to be able to coach during practice. Man, uh, it is a funny <laughs> situation. It's not surprising with Jim Harbaugh that, uh, you know, when it first came out and we started to hear about this, and it was like, yeah, Jim may have lied to the investigators. I was thinking, you know, one, I, I'm not going to say that this guy will never lie or hasn't lied or whatever. I don't know any of that for a fact, but it just doesn't seem like one, a liar. Uh, I think, I, you know, we know him well enough at that point to say that. And two, someone that's that stupid to lie to them. Uh, and, and then it starts coming out that all he said was he didn't recall some of this stuff. And the NCAA was upset that he didn't quote unquote cooperate cooperate as much uh and they're like well we're gonna stick it to this guy i think knowing jim harbaugh in following him and, and covering him that they may have picked the wrong guy uh, because i don't think he's gonna lay down his sword uh and that's kind of what it seems like the ncaa wants him to do they're like hey we'll lessen this penalty we'll give you a two game suspension we'll uh you know we'll take we'll do a plea bargain or whatever you want to call it and jim harbaugh is like no i'm not settling this i didn't lie and uh that's basically where we are. They're at a, a stalemate. It's kind of like the the gift from the office when they're all pointing the the uh, finger guns at each other and nobody <laughs> wants to make the first move. I feel like that's where we're at right now with Jim Harbaugh and the NCAA. Um, you know, the thing that I'm watching the most is, is his contract extension and how that plays into it. It seems like Michigan wants to wait on that until there's some sort of resolution with the NCAA investigation just to demonstrate that they are taking this seriously and that they're not going to make a coach who's facing a, a level one violation, you know, perhaps one of the highest paid coaches in college football. But um, at the same time, this thing could drag on for years, as we've seen with the NCAA. Not exactly an organization that uh, seems that well run or that can think, get things done very swiftly. So uh, I'm just interested to see how that dynamic plays out. But I would still imagine we get a Jim Harbaugh contract extension with uh, some big money, maybe a bigger buyout. Uh, I think everybody will be happy in that case and uh, we can move on. But yeah, I mean, let's, let's say, I mean, it goes two years. I mean, look at Sean Miller over at Xavier, who was at Arizona. It just came out this year that he wasn't going to get a penalty for being caught on FBI wiretap talking <laughs> about paying recruits. Yeah. So the NCAA is just another thing. I can't predict what's going to happen there, but I do respect Jim Harbaugh's fight. I know he, he, he kind of likes a good fight. I feel like he might be enjoying this a little bit. And uh, I don't blame him. You know, he's always been a guy that's, that's called for change and pushed for different issues with the NCAA. And now he has his chance to stand up to him and, and good for him. Well, there is a lot going on in the Michigan athletic scene between basketball and IL recruiting, uh, the coaching uh, search for the replacement for Matt Weiss. And as I tell my listeners, if you all want to keep up on that, uh, you need to subscribe to the Wolverine magazine or the Wolverine on three. Those of us who do know that it's a, uh, you guys do such a great job there, Clayton. So before we let you get away, if you could just tell my listeners uh, how they can subscribe to either the magazine or the Wolverine on 3. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, for the Wolverine over on, on 3, uh, just hit us up over at thewolverine.com. And, you know, if you hit a paywall uh, on one of our premium articles or uh, just hit the banner at the top, we're running a deal right now where it's twenty nine ninety nine until football season, August thirty one. Uh, of this year and then uh, and then you can renew at full price but that's a that's a good deal that's 70 percent off or so uh so take advantage of that and then for the magazine the wolverine on demand.com you can do that we're uh gonna have our football recruiting issue here next month we are going to have our football preview issue as always in the summer the 160 or so pages of everything you need to know about michigan football going into the year so uh stay tuned for that um but yeah, Mike, I appreciate it. Uh, enjoy it every time I come on, and, uh, and hopefully we can chat soon. Oh, absolutely. And uh, for all of my listeners out there, and I'll uh, put it in uh, the show notes, that's a great deal that you just mentioned uh, for the Wolverine. So hop on it, folks, and get all of your Wolverine news every day. Here with us on the show today, has, uh, as you know, Clayton Safey from the Wolverine Magazine. 
and the Wolverine on three. Clayton, always a pleasure having you on the show, and we look forward to that next visit. Anytime. Thanks for having me. On Quick Hits today, the number 13-ranked University of Michigan women's basketball team fell behind early and could not catch up, dropping a 92-83 contest to number 6-ranked Indiana on Monday evening at Chrysler Center. They will kick off a two-game road swing on Thursday, heading to Maryland to face the number 10-ranked Terrapins at 6.30 p.m. on the Big Ten Network. Junior defenseman Jacob Truscott capped off a tremendous weekend on the road, by scoring the game-winning goal in front of a sold-out crowd as the 8th-ranked University of Michigan hockey team knocked off number 2 Minnesota by a 5-4 score in 3-on-3 overtime on Saturday night in Minneapolis. This weekend, the Wolverines return to the friendly confines of Yost Ice Arena for a two-game series against Penn State on Friday and Saturday. Puck drop for both games is set for 7 p.m. Friday's contest will be streamed live on Big Ten Plus, while the second meeting will be broadcast live on the Big Ten Network. Number three ranked wrestling, 8-1 and one overall, 3-1 and one in the Big Ten, will host a pair of Big Ten conference duels at home this weekend. The Wolverines welcome number six Ohio State at 6 p.m. on Friday at Chrysler Center before hosting Maryland at noon on Sunday at Cliff Keen Arena. Friday's duel will be broadcast live on the Big Ten Network, while Sunday's matchup will be streamed live on Big Ten+. Plus. We are just two weeks away from softball opening up the season down in Florida, and baseball will get their show on the road in just three weeks. So it's all right around the corner. We'll have more on both of those teams in the coming weeks. That does it for now. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Thanks for tuning in, and make sure you tell your family and friends about the show and join us again next week. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Until we meet again, take care. And as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze & Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at themichiganmanpodcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!